I'm a meathead. I like bottom fishing. I like deep dropping. Grouper fishing is my thing. Um, red snapper fishing ain't all that bad. I hate red snapper. For people that follow my YouTube channel, and know how much I hate those things, especially uh, being from the Atlantic. I hate them to eat or hate them to just in general? I, I just hate them. I just hate them. Nick. And how did it start out? Like, what was the origin story? Too much alcohol. Really? Okay. <laughs> Because if God wanted us to have fiberglass boats, he would have given us fiberglass trees. It's it's for fishermen. It's not for taking the wife and the wife's friends. It's, I think that it's a really, really pretty bit. And then there was a blur that went by and ended up in the cockpit, as yeah. far as if I can remember uh-huh. correctly. <laughs> Welcome back, State of Sport Fishing Podcast. I'm Nick Carullo. Today, uh, my co-host, Leo Chapman, founder of Billfish Gear and also The Pod. Uh, today, our guest is Joe Von Thron from Louisiana. Uh, thanks for joining us, man, on short notice. How you doing? I'm doing good, man. I'm glad to be on the show. Yeah, thanks for coming on, dude. So uh, tell us the, the charter operation you're running now. So I work for a company uh, called Louisiana Blue Water Charters. Uh, we have two 37 Freemans. We're in the works of leasing another 37 Freemans, uh, Freeman, and uh, we got uh, 26 blackjack, a 26 blue wave, and a 23 blue wave as well on the inshore side of things. So, you know, it's a it's a pretty broad fishery. Um, it's a unique fishery there that you pretty much the standard issue is Freemans and Yellowfins and 39 contenders. So, yeah, it's a, it's big there. Everything, you have to do it big in Venice, so. Yeah, yeah. You said that you're in the process of leasing a Freeman. I've heard, like, I've seen posts about this. The charter operations down there, what's that like? Is it like a, an owner who leases their boat to a charter company for them to use? Could you kind of like go a little bit more into that? So um, there's there's quite a few boats that are like that. Um, ours is a little bit similar, different, um, what we have our thing set up, but there is quite a few boats that have private owners that, you know, they have the right, I guess, licenses or permits. I don't know how exactly how the permit works over there it's way different than the east coast but there's i would say i mean there's probably 10 or 15 boats that aren't like a part of a company that just sign leases and we'll go here and go there and people borrow boats if they have a boat broken down um, we have our backup boats too so it's kind of all over the place i'm um i'm sure that like voodoo and mexican gulf these big um companies that have been around forever i think a lot of them uh, own their boats outright the actual company does but i would say for the majority of the fleet it's um even if the boat is owned by like an owner or a member of the company the way it ends up on paper is the boat is leased by uh the company every charter does that make sense yeah so interesting. yeah yeah so it's it's essentially if, on paper i'm pretty sure the majority of the fleet it's all it's all leasing boats to these title companies your voodoos your la blue waters your mexican gulf so it's different it's different i mean it's just just mainly because it'd be a lot easier if one person could afford um you know a freeman but not many people on earth can afford an eight hundred thousand dollar charter boat by themselves especially if you are in the charter industry (laughs) so it's uh yeah it's there's a whole bunch of different combinations of owners and all kinds of you know mixed ownership throughout the whole fleet how many how many captains are a part of your operation so they have myself i do inshore mainly offshore we have alex sewell who does offshore and inshore here and there um and bob hovey who uh pretty much does offshore and we have a couple of guys rotating in the inshore as well but i would say we have uh four full-time captains um that run trips we have charlie uh, a kid named charlie too that is incredible at inshore and he pretty much does all our inshore stuff but uh, yeah, we have four right now. Nice. And how do you guys? And how do you guys compare to like Voodoo? Like how, as far as like charters, are you guys book crazy as much as they are. Um. So I mean, Voodoo. I mean, every every the way that the whole fleet looks at it, everybody is chasing Voodoo and uh, Mexican Gulf just because they've been around for so long. It's like the first thing that you think of when you think of Venice, Louisiana charter fleet. It's it's probably Voodoo or Mexican. Yeah, I Gulf. think of Voodoo for sure. I mean. Yeah, that's that's definitely what I always I, I actually I didn't know Mexican Gulf was a thing until I visited Venice the first time. But then it's like there's no mistake. They got more boats than everybody else. And it's all Freemans. And then you get in the whole background of how um, how they essentially built the first Freeman boat 
Bill built that first one and really brought Freeman out of the gutter and made it to the best center consoles ever made. Um, but yeah, we, we book pretty, pretty heavily. Our busiest time of the year is coming up. So our big, big tuna times are, um, and January, end of January, all of February and, uh, the beginning of March. And then starting like probably like the first couple of weeks of November, that's when our big fish are here. So like October, November, uh, February and March, like we will be slammed, absolutely slammed. And then, you know, it, once we get into the summertime, it gets more sparsely booked. Like we'll, we'll book weekends and stuff, especially when snapper are open. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a, yeah, it's, it's a lot. Is it slow now because it's just rougher now because of winter or. Yeah. I mean, no, we, I mean, we have, the days that it's fishable, we got like a list of, of regulars that we can call, say, hey, we're going, you know how the fishing is right now. And the fishing is good right now. Every day that they're getting out there, someone's catching, you know, multiple fish over 150. But so that's how they kind of stay afloat this time of year. Um, but uh, yeah, it's 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 tough for the weather cancellations because you if you're going to do Venice, right, you really have to stay down there. So it's like it's it's if you're booking it an hour and a half south of new orleans with no civilization in between um really the proper way to do venice is to stay in the houseboats for a minimum of two nights you know get there stay stay the night fish the next day if you're just going to do one day and then stay the night and then go back and fly back um however which way you came but it's just really hard to um you know deal with the weather and cancellations this time of year so it's like it's not like the majority of our customers are local like you know yeah. i chartered in jacksonville for a while a long time and uh I would say, you know, before I got a bunch of bookings, you know, nationally from YouTube, I would say about 70% are local there. It's, it's probably the opposite. You know, we have 30% of people that are from um, the surrounding States, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, um, East Texas. So it's so hard to, um, you know, say that, okay, we might be able to try it. Come on down. It's like, you can't do that. Like this is a, a very expensive place to fish, first of all. And it's legit three days of you know someone's time so we, we try to make it work as best as we can um and we let people know that book this time of year is like hey you might get canceled for weather but um it's the right time of year to book really so people are willing to take the risk and you know like 90 percent of them they'll they'll just book for a different uh, time of year they'll just rebook so it definitely adds another layer of um i guess difficulty um through the uncertainty of weather cancellation stuff like that when you're running the boat what's your preferred uh target species or is well i'm a meathead i like bottom fishing i like deep dropping grouper fishing is my thing um red snapper fishing ain't all that bad i hate red snapper for people that follow my youtube channel and know how much i hate those things especially uh, being from the atlantic i hate them to eat or hate them to just in general i i just hate them I just hate them, Nick. I could go oh, on and on. We'll we'll save that for if, if you need another uh, thirty minutes at the end of the podcast. <laughs> we'll get onto that subject. Uh, but, we'll save that. Yeah, but uh, you know, I'm a meathead. I love bottom fishing, but uh, chasing big tunas, man, that's 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 fun. And sword fishing, I really that's a there's a really good fishery for the swords out there. You know, our average fish is a pup, you know, a release fish. But if you spend a whole day sword fishing, you're gonna you know get probably three three to five shots definitely of fighting a fish for an extended period of time but most of that doesn't matter because 90 percent of the people come to venice louisiana for tuna it's tuna town yeah. and a lot of people will you know be like tuna or dies like you know <sighs> sometimes the floaters just get just horrible i mean it's just just awful fishing and we'll tell these people like hey this is not working out great um, or like bait's been slow or, you know, there's only one rig that's holding enough fish um, and everybody else is getting there first. Or it's like, it's a, it's a rat race and people will just be like, no, we're gone. We came here for tuna. Yeah. yeah. What's, what's you typically style for the tunas? Are you like chunking or live baiting or? Live bait is, you know, really the way to go. You either jig up bait on the um, inshore platforms. Um, you cast net pogies or cast net mullet. But uh, um, yeah, live chumming and, and, and live baiting is like the standard issue not many people troll i mean you can get bites on ballyhoo um, certain times a year you can definitely do all right but uh you know i mean live live bait is king it's it is what it is so that's really what you 
what we look for. It's really weird that the amount of the, the, you really never catch yellowfin like keeper size yellowfin on jigs. I think I heard of one this year get caught on jigs. So the, I wish that was a little a factor or a wrinkle that we could add to our uh, arsenal of techniques. But unfortunately, that's just not the way of the world. I will say at night you can jig them up, but still, it's weird. I don't, I, I don't, I wish it was not that way, but it is what it is. What's a, what's a typical day of fishing out of Venice like? Like what time do you leave? What's the run like? Oh man. So the craziest part about the whole scenario is the run far none, but um, depending on obviously the time of the year, the sun gets up or uh, gets up really early in the summertime. So um, try to leave between five and five 30 um, at the longer days of the year. Then we'll head out of one of the passes. It's usually about a 20 mile run to the end of the pass. Then we'll run like 10 to 15 miles more to get to our first uh, rig to catch live bait. And then hopefully we get it done in one rig, but the, you know how fishing works. We usually bounce around another five to 10 miles to find the right rig to get enough bait. And then you run, gosh, I guess we're, we're going from the east side catching bait. It's usually a 60 to 80 mile run from there. 50 to 80 mile. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's, it's docked a spot pretty much a hundred miles one way if you're going to uh fish the floaters at least that's how it was last summer sometimes you get lucky and your close rigs like 989 and elf and uh the compound will be holding fish but uh, that was very few days this past year the fish were a lot further than they were closer this year so about 100 miles from dock spot is usually what we did a busy day out there how many how many other charter boats are you fighting with like at a certain rig there Man, so it's it, it varies a lot. Some 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 people have a really tough time uh, staying quiet because they want to tell everybody that how good they are at fishing and caught fish. So you'll have some <laughs> people just run their mouth and you know just oh I went to Thunder Horse today and it was on. And then the next day you show up and you know you get there at at eight o'clock is like thinking you're going to be the first or second boat there and there's already eight boats there and it ends up being fifteen or so and then nobody can catch fish because but um you know it's it's if a rig has been consistently good, like two or three boats, I mean, there's so many rigs to fish, but it, there's some, there is sometimes like, like I said, there's you because just for whatever reason, the other rigs aren't holding fish, whether not the right temperature or loop currents or clarity or yada, yada, any, anything that's on Hilton's whatever. But um, yeah, it, it could get pretty crowded quickly, which is what I referred to earlier as the rat race. You know, it's getting there in a timely manner. Um, is the most important thing like especially like in the beginning of the season whenever uh you know we're getting pogies and running out to like the compound and whatever it's there's several days that uh if we weren't the first boat there we would have just had terrible days so there's one day that we went to a drill ship in the compound um the compound for your listeners is a group of like three three big giant um oil platforms, multiple drill ships, and there's a couple of other drill platforms on the other side. That's what we call the compound. They're all compacted together. Um, but anyways, we made this run to this drill ship and we set out baits and it's like, it was just, you know, automatic. You put freebies out and they're already boiling on it right next to the boat. Like you could free gaff one of the things. And, you know, we got like six on our first drift. Um, and there's right behind us, uh, uh, the Tito's voodoo boat pulls in and they put baits in the water. They get two on their first drift. We reset, we get, um, we get one more, the Tito's boats gets two more and then the whole fleet, you know, caught up with us. And then I think, um, for the next like three hours between about eight boats, there was like three good fish caught. Like, it's just, it's so, yeah, it's stressful that, that rat race. I hate it. I really do hate it. It's just, you know, if we took a pee break, we would have went from, you know, four fish on the day or, or eight fish on the day to four, like, oh, yeah. It's crazy how it, how, I mean, fish, how close are you fishing to the other boats? Um, you give them space. Sometimes you you, you drift kind of with each other, but we're pretty good about you know staying away from each other. So you know it's not it's you don't really want to be on top of them, especially uh, if you're throwing freebies out. A lot of them will just go and find your boat or um, someone else's boat, especially if you're using blue runners and stuff like that. But you try to keep a good distance. And also, I mean, I'm a guy, I don't, I like to stay on like the outside of things and not mess anybody up. So I try to keep as much distance as I can without being too far from the fish, you know? What's the camaraderie like? Is everyone kind of 
good friends with each other or is there because i like you said there's a lot of people kind of fighting for the spot i imagine things can get a little hectic um yeah i'd say the camaraderie is decent uh you know comparing it to other places that i know of it's pretty good you know the majority of people are cordial with each other um you know you have your little group of friends that you know you know how it is in fishing you have your little your little click your little group um and then you have your big companies with like voodoo and the mexican golf company that i think people resent them because uh you know they just you know having that many boats in a fleet it's it makes life so much easier in terms of bait and where the fish are and stuff like that so i think of those guys you know catch a lot of hate in the fleet because of that i don't have any problem with any of the guys there i think they're all great captains and i've never had an issue but um it's funny how people you know get jealous of that kind of thing and i'm jealous of it too I'm, I'm i mean i wish i had eight other captains out there to get that i could base my next day of fishing on based on their report but uh i would say it's yeah it's pretty good i mean it's a lot better than you'd think for a bunch of occasions and whatnot <laughs> i mean are there like rigs that like let's say like your fleet is let's say heading to like if some boats haven't fished in a while because of weather and then you know a bunch of boats go and maybe one of the voodoo guys had had gone and they have like you know they do have some sort of report and you guys go one direction and they go the other direction and you guys just completely miss them i mean yeah, yeah it, it happens i really i don't like following people like that like especially if it's a different company or someone i don't know well um but yeah i mean you strike out some days and it sucks because it's such a far run it's such an expensive trip but i mean yeah. it's I mean, also you can follow, you could do the opposite. You can follow a report and, you know, fit, be the only boat at the rig the entire day. And the day before someone caught, you know, a six man limit with a fish up to fish up to like 150 pounds. And the next day it's like, there was never a fish there. It's like, it's like you doubt that there was fish caught there the day before, but that's just how it is. That's tuna fishing, man. It'll make you, you want to you pull your head. out the source of your information. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just how tuna fishing is though. It's just like, it's so day to day. It's like, it's like makes you want to freaking slit your wrist sometimes. It's just like, why is this not working? And we do the same thing every day. Yesterday we caught fish this way and tomorrow we're going to catch fish this way. I know, but it's not working right now. And it's worse. Oh God. It's the worst part of that fishery is sometimes those fish get so keyed in on specific bait that it doesn't matter what you have that you could put whatever you want right in front of them. They're not going to eat it. So this happened twice this year. They got, um, there was a school of like bullet Bonita bullet mackerel that were all about that big. Um, and literally you'd see, you know, a hundred fish air out an hour and, you know, it, it, blue runners, you know, horn bellies, greenies, whatever you want to, throw at them they're not eating anything except for that the other time it gets really weird is they'll just eat little micro baits and fish underneath sargasm um there was the last day that that happened to us we actually ended up catching one and uh you know gutting him before putting him on ice he was just full of little like baby puffer fish and seahorses and, and little trigger fish just random shit like it's it's just yeah it's tuna fishing man it's frustrating it's difficult <laughs> holy smokes i just watched you uh freak out of oahu yeah, I did do that. Yeah, that's another part of my little fishing journey. So I, I started, I guess I'll explain that. So I started, worked on a headboat, um, bottom fishing right out of high school. Did that for a long time in between uh, college. I actually coached football in the SEC. I'm not sure if you guys are football guys. I was yeah. at the University of Tennessee under Butch Jones for four seasons. Nice. Um, after that, came back, worked on the party boat a little bit more. And then I went out and um, I did a Who's year. Party boat out of? Uh, Jacksonville, Mayport. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So you're originally a Jacksonville guy. Right, yeah. Jacksonville is my home base. I still consider it my home base. That's where my taxes go to, so. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, after coming back and working on that party boat a little bit longer, uh, got my license and got hired on a boat in the uh, California Long Range Fleet, so out of San Diego. So we do seven to 16-day trips fishing all up and down Baja. That's where I freak out the Wahoo. Um, and that's some of the most incredible fishing that I've uh you know, ever seen. That's just such a special area. And then COVID happened and then I moved back to Jacksonville, started doing private charters here, et cetera. And then now I'm in Venice, Louisiana. What's that pinnacle they fish out of there, uh, San Diego, way out there? Mm, there's a couple of them. One, the most famous place probably is Alejos Rocks. That's like just a giant rock stru structure in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, like 150 miles away from anything else. 
that's like the probably the most famous wahoo fishing spot in the entire planet um really cool place uh there's another cool island called guadalupe island which is my favorite place on earth that's where they film pretty much all of the shark week stuff there's a really good population of big yellows there and uh a bunch of great white sharks which are always cool to see but i mean that sucks because they can eat 150 pound tuna literally in one bite they're just big animals and the other i would say the most famous tuna place out there is clarion in the hurricane bank um that is like, I think it's like an 800 mile run one way from San Diego, but those islands um, have been closed for a while. Uh, actually, no, the Hurricane Bank is open, but Clarion um, is closed, which is the much better spot. And Hurricane Bank is a one boat spot. And uh, I think the Red Rooster went out there a couple of times when I was there and they struck out both times. So it's like, it's a humongous risk to go 800 miles to fish one spot, you know, but there's still people that re- want to relive those glory days of going out there and catching those, you know, cows and super cows. And, uh, there's, they still book those trips 16 days. Yeah. We had a guy on the pod, not too long or a little while earlier in the year, or I guess last year, but, uh, he did one of those trips. It was like, um, yeah, it was like a 16 day long range. Right. Trip. It sounds badass. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. It, it's it's uh yeah it's a really cool industry it's just all those boats are the way they're built and geared towards that tuna fishery it's all geared around live bait the bait receivers there are incredible i wish that uh you know we had access to live bait over here like that they have giant barges that have have you ever seen pictures or videos of that it's essentially just a bunch of 10 by 10 crates yeah. that are filled to the brim with sardines they got these per same boats that go out uh per same bait and then they pump them inside of the boat and which so the entire hole is like a live wall and then they pump it out of the boat into these pens and they cure the live bait for you know a couple of days or a couple of weeks and uh we would take 250 passes of sardines um which is like you know depending on the grade like 25 to 50 baits per pass and we held the second least amount of bait in the entire fleet the independence uh, can take 1500 scoops of live bait. So that's just, you know, wow. you're just constantly, yeah, you're pouring bait over the side. Wow. Um, it's yeah, that's definitely the best way to get fish going is just throw 500 live sardines in the water and just make them, make them eat. Yeah. Can't resist that. Mm-hmm. That's sick. What about back in back home? Are you guys able to pin up bait like we do here? Uh, in Jacksonville, uh, kind Not Jacksonville, of. about Venice. Ha, absolutely not it's fresh water 100 fresh water oh, yeah yeah 100 fresh water wow. it's, a, it's a it's a another annoying wrinkle uh that we have to deal with and if you go to like grand isle or dolphin island you know west and east of us it's it's you know the same where they can pin up whatever they want but uh yeah that it sucks that we can't keep live bait overnight because that would you know take care of the whole rat race issue you just catch bait at the end of a trip instead of the beginning of the trip and pen it up or, or whatever we do have a uh, you know everybody has their own little recirculating pumps that they run and it's hit or miss you know it's you know we add our little fish tank anti-ammonia stuff to it and you'll put people put bags of ice in them or put fans on the water just so it doesn't overheat from the pump and yeah. it's it's almost almost uh too much trouble for what it's worth um but yeah, it's a, it's a huge pain in the ass. It definitely makes it a little bit more difficult because uh, it's 100% fresh water. Never had to flush an engine the entire time that uh, I've been there. <laughs> wow. It's pretty crazy. We have some questions here for you um, that fans have, have reached out to us to, uh, to ask. So if you don't, do you mind answering a couple of them? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, first one, um, once person asked about your favorite reel, I saw on your Instagram that was the Shimano Stella. What does like a good fishing setup look like for someone fishing out of Venice? Like for example, in the dead bait world, it's pretty standard, you know, 30 pound tests, some type of a light tackle rod. You know, it's pretty, we think we've covered that. We've beaten that to death. When it comes to like fishing out of Venice, what does that look like? That's a whole other world. Uh, well, for stars, I would say I, the Shimano Torsa, which is not in, made anymore, is my favorite reel ever. Um, actually, I got one right here. How about that? Here's a 20. <laughs> How about that? Arms reach. Yeah, that's my favorite reel ever. I would say that for what it's built for, the Shimano Stella is is by far the best reel made. Um, you know, it is 
the amount of power that it has and you know the technology in it in terms of like where the, the, the they switched up the drag so the heat would go up instead of down in the real it's just so good for what it's made for um but i would say and what's the, that for those who don't know what's that and what's that for those who don't know what it was made the, for oh well it's uh you know typically it's used in you know when you think of it like it's used mostly there's probably more Stella is used in Australia in the Mediterranean for, uh, you know, their tuna fishing and uh, in Australia, the Wahoo fishing is big and their Spanish mackerel, which are essentially just a kingfish on steroids. That's probably uh, where they are used the most. But here it's just, you know, throwing tuna on poppers or if you want to go light tackle, live bait. Um, wherever i use it to jig cobia i use it for absolutely everything everything that i can but i mean it's just it has a lot of you have so much power and such a light and small reel that it really it it's such a you can fish for so many things it's so broad that what you can use it for it's such a great tool to have they're expensive but i mean you get you get what you pay for in the fishing industry and you definitely uh you get what you pay for with that reel yeah but um you know the what main thing the that we baiting? use uh like bfcs or Oh, I, uh, the wait, the rod you said? No, for the reel. If you're like a conventional. Oh, what reels do we use? Um, yeah, like use not a, obviously not a Stella. I'm saying like conventional. Yeah, we use Talicus. Pretty much Talicus. that's what the standard issue is there. Yeah. Um, I actually, today I ordered a bunch of Abbots. Um, I got in touch with a guy that was the Abbott rep on um, that ran trips on the boat that I worked on. He was the charter master or whatever. Um, I actually ordered a bunch of reels from him today. Some of the Raptors, that's the same thing. People, I mean, I used to talk down on Abbott a lot too, but you get what you pay for with them as well. It's like, cause they have like the same reel. There's like four subcategories of reels and there's four versions of that reel. And if you get like the Raptors, their high end version, it's like the same thing as Italica and that they're lighter and they have, I think they have more power. I really like what's them the, a lot. What's the price point on that one? Uh, so they actually have three speeds that those are right under seven hundred dollars and the regular two speed is right under six hundred dollars so about the same about the same as italica um mm. yeah but um and you can add power handles on them and I, I have for all my tuna stuff i have power handles on everything it just makes life so much easier um, Got it. but yeah so going what, back so, to yeah so what else would you need to to really rig a boat let's get a, let's just say you get a brand new boat and they tell you you know go and rig it for venice fishing well, that's easy because i have i've actually been um the past like three weeks uh I'll, I'll first i'll say this you, as a captain in venice you have to outfit your entire boat all your tackle all your rods all your reels because uh you bounce from boat to boat so much so it's like yeah it sucks i don't i don't think there's anywhere else in america that's like that but like i have to supply every single piece of my tackle so what i just got was those reels so like a talica 25 esque reel um you can put 60 pound braid on it i'm more comfortable with 80 pound braid to the spool there's plenty of line uh, with a top shot like 80 or 60 pound top shot and then you know 15 foot of flora depending on the day or the size of the bait or the size of the fish you can change up um i like long rods i'm a big fan of eight foot rods it's tough in the charter world to do that so you know a pretty stout seven foot rod um some people like the uh adjust the butts you know the the winthrop butts so you can find them out of the rod holder for me or butt yeah yeah that's right uh the uh what, what did you call it nick terminator yeah, yeah. okay yeah. um so you can find them out of the rod holder uh that's really the standard issue for the live bait thing 80 pound braid um and then you know you we we all have our spinning setups for poppers and stuff like that that's we're about to get to the uh, best time of the year for that coming up on lump season so we'll have some you know you know, Saragossa uh, 20,000s or twin power 1400s or 14,000s. And um, I got some really good rods from Nomad. They're, you know, eight foot bluefin tuna popper rods. They sent me a couple of them. So I'm excited to use those. They're super stout, super light. Uh, and uh, you got to have your 50 wides for your marlin fishing that's a that's another issue that was over there there's so many things to fish for it's hard to say like here's what you need for venice because it's like all right if it's if it swims in the gulf of mexico there's a really good chance that it's probably good fishing for it in venice so it's it's hard to like plan a day around everything and plan a boat around everything uh but i mean it's like what do you want to catch just bring whatever you want to used for that but 50 wide we bring 50s and 80s we bring an 80 wide for uh sword fishing on top of that uh 50s for mate. marlin fishing what's that you bring a mate mm -hmm. yeah everybody brings mates everybody everybody bring, yeah yeah it's a 
you wouldn't be able to fish the way we fish with the live bait and live chumming. And, yeah, no, it's a lot um, of work. Trust me. Yeah, yeah. It, it would make it, yeah, it would make it super, super hard. It'd be like trying to work a kite with by yourself and steering a boat and everything like that. It's, it's not, it's probably possible, but it's, it's going to be a lot more efficient and better if you got a mate full time. But yeah, you pretty much have your live bait, you know, Talica sets up, setups, your big spinners, um, a 50 or a 50 for Marlin and really big fish because we did the live bait, you know, tuna dart thing over there pretty often. Um, have a 50 and eight or an 80 for your swordfish. And then like, we'll, we'll have some electric reels and stuff thrown in the build somewhere and, you know, some slow pitch rods, whatever. I mean, but that's why it's, it's, we have extensive conversations with the people that fish with us the, you know, the day before or the week before um, we go out. It's like, what do you want to catch? It's like, we got to make sure it's on the boat. Cause if, if you don't want to catch red snapper, like we're not bringing, you know, we don't have to have the electric reels or all the other bottom fishing stuff. It's like we can leave six rods at the house if you don't want to bottom fish or maybe you want a deep drop. So, okay, we got to have the electric reels. We got to bring spare batteries, make sure we got all the plugs. It's just like, that's one thing that is difficult about that fishery. It's so broad. It's, it's very, very broad. Gotcha. That's Interesting. Cool. So what, another question for you, what Mark, what is to you the most memorable moment that you had on the water or the most memorable day memorable day Ooh, most well the most memorable day is uh when i was in california we had um we had a day where we had 115 wahoo uh, actually it was 120 because the the chef and the assistant chef caught five by themselves so yeah we had 120 wahoo one day our best stop was 24 uh that was nuts that was one day I, i'll regret my entire life that I didn't run upstairs to the crew quarters and get my GoPro, but it's like, I didn't have time. It was like, when we were done putting fish away, we were blowing the horn again because we were, we were hooked up on a triple. It's like, like it was literally nonstop sun up, sun down. And I remember counting that, like counting down. It's like, are we going to hit triple digits? Like, it's like, Oh my God, we got 25 left. It's like, then we got it was like we're 17 left. I was like, Oh, we just had to stop at 10. We have seven left. I was like, we're at 110. It's like, we're at 115. It's like, Holy shit. Like, this is unbelievable. Wow. It was weird to think it's like, to think like in the, like the entire world of boats and fishing is like on this boat today was probably the best fishing in the entire planet. It's like I can pretty confidently say that 120 Wahoo one day definitely has a claim to that. That's <laughs> so probably it's weird. Be the most ever caught yeah. in a day. Oh no, dude. It's <laughs> so the Wahoo over there are stupid. It's like if we went, you know, to the Bahamas and tried to barracuda fish, there's just barracuda and there's thousands of them. It's what's it's the, what's that, the size on one. That that day, what was the average size? Um, so their grade isn't huge. Uh, it was actually a good grade for the Baja part of the world. It's like probably right at right under forty pounds. The biggest fish that we caught that day was actually the biggest fish of the year. I think it was 70, 76, I think. Um, and that was I think by I think our next biggest was like right over sixty. So it's mainly like that twenty five to forty pound range fish. That's where you what you see the majority of the time down there that's really rare that you get uh, a fish brought back that's over 80 pounds or 90 pounds i don't think there's ever been a triple digit wahoo caught in the uh long range fleet come to think of it but it's hmm. you know it's it's got the numbers that's for sure that's, it's got uh, the numbers that's all on the sardines um so the way that you fish these it's it's really probably it's probably my favorite way to fish for anything so you got a troll rotation right so you got five rods all with marauders or um right when i was there like nomads were the shit it was like when they came out with those lip lures like yeah, yeah. and it was like it was like five to one it was crazy but like it was before nomad really figured out how like how to make that bait last you know 100 fish and so they would break a lot but it was it was cool because i was there like in the overlap of the old shitty ones and when they figured it out and you could tell like the ones out of the new ones out of the package were so much better and they could last all kinds of fish but you know you'd have the old ones split in half all the time but so you have your troll set up um and everybody is lying the gunnels and facing backwards holding a rod in a wahoo bomb which is essentially it looks like a like a tuna feather you know i'm talking about like a cone tuna feather um was essentially a lead head with some tinsel on the back of it and like an illinois leaf off the hook or a heavy surface iron which is you know essentially just a heavy spoon that sinks everyone's lying the gunnel a rod gets hit, you sound the horn, then everybody just throws backwards and just in free spool, keeps in free spool until the boat comes to a complete stop. And then you put the rod on the rail and you just reel as fast as you possibly can. And uh, 
that's that's how they wahoo fish over there they do some live baiting but it's like you get a lot of trash with it you know you get your little skipjacks and little yellowfin mixed in but getting that bomb bite holy shit man that's the most electric feeling ever the first one that i ever had eat a bomb it was like ate it like perfect like cinematically just on the surface just saw it from way over here on top of a wave coming for this green bomb and it just it oh my god it's it's pretty wild feeling catching a wahoo that way that's pretty cool that's awesome Damn. sick dude yeah a lot of wahoo right. that's yeah it's a shit little wahoo <laughs> how long did it how long did it take to clean them so that's the other really interesting thing about uh california is uh First of all, we didn't have time to clean fish. So we'd show up back at the dock between five and six AM and we were leaving for the next trip um wow. at noon. So Wait, what, what they have what they have so there is they have fish processors. There's three, three or four main ones um out of California. And uh, some boats they have like their own sponsored. So you have to use their uh, the boat's processor but like we didn't care we didn't have anything so you could choose they're there every morning so you would uh we would offload the fish and put them in carts they roll the carts up the ramp onto the pier and uh you know you just wait around for your number get called have a pile of fish at your feet and then you can take your fish to whatever processor you want um they take down your information they uh really they just keep track of your number whatever number of the boat you're on um weigh the fish they and you watch them weigh the fish and it's a whole weight and they'll take it and they have a giant warehouse with 50 people that are filleting fish and back sealing fish and freezing fish. And you can actually ship fish that way too. But um, yeah, that's a, that's a lot of fish. It's a lot of fish to process, even for those guys. That's why there's four of them in business. Well, that, I mean, it, that, so that trip you caught the hundred in a day or over a hundred, you know, that, that trip is, you know, you said they're six to 14 day trips. How many, what, what was the total fish count for that trip? So, um, so they, they have limits. The Mexican, the Mexican limits are so screwy and weird. Um, so you can have a max, a three day limit. Um, that's the most you can have just three days. So you can't, if you're, if you're gone for 10 days, you can't keep a 10, 10 days of a limit. So it's three days, um, max five fish per species per day. So you can keep like 15 yellowfin, um, or 15 Wahoo. Um, and, uh, you essentially could keep two species a day. So you could keep 30 fish, but here's where it gets really weird. Certain fish count for more than one fish. So if you kill a, like a big giant Gulf grouper or black sea bass, that counts as five fish towards your total limit. And this, the worst one ever, which is this, You're this about rule, person limit, right? Personal limit. And yeah. how many people are on one of those rigs? We would take 20 to 24. That was like a little sweet spot. Huh. Um, which is crowded, but you know, those dudes, they have nothing else to fish for over there. It's a pretty narrow fishery in terms of species, but those guys, um, literally since they were in high school, you know, fr were free line and live sardines. Like they got it. Like there's a lot of really incredible guys on the rod and reel over there. So they kind of got that, but, uh, like back to the limits, the worst one is, um, Mahi or Dorado as they call them over there. One fish counts as two and a half fish. And that, you know, the Dorado over there, are by far the most populated species. It's ridiculous. I always say, like, I love mahi, but I absolutely despise dorado because <laughs> you, yeah, you it, you won't be able to fish some of those banks for a month because there's legitimately hundreds of thousands of mahi on them. Like, yeah, it's bad. I mean, some of some of the boats can't go fast enough to outrun them while they're wahoo fishing. Um, if the if the grade of the fish is too big, they can just catch the baits. It's like I mean, those boats are so heavy; they're essentially displacement holes with all that live well space and you know the sheer size of them. They can only go like twelve knots, um, and that's peeling the paint off. So, um, you, it's crazy. You just see them porpoising behind the baits. And you're like, please oh, yeah. don't eat it. Please don't eat because then Jesus. it's the crew's it's the crew's responsibility to uh, if it is a mahi, we have to take turns reeling the mahi in while we're still at trolling speed because if we slow down at all, then your one mahi turns into five mahi. And it's just a, yeah. And yeah, it's a nightmare. And the worst part of uh, the Mahi stay the worst in the RSW. They do not stay fresh. So the way the fish are stored, I guess another what's, question. What's how the RSW? Hell... Yeah. So RSW is refrigerated seawater. Um, I'm sure people back home are asking how the hell do you store that much fish? So um, we would have, we had three slammers in deck. One was only for fish storage two others started as um thousand gallon live wells that uh would be our floor you know our floor uh, reserve 
uh, that we could turn into uh, RSW space. So like we would, or we would just, you know, continually, we had three tops, two floors, and then we'd have like two little small wells in the bow. And so we would take, if we needed it, we could move bait around or as we needed it, take it out and put it in the top. So you drain that. Um, and we actually had chillers that were made to chill uh, like zoo exhibits. Like you go to SeaWorld and see the beluga whales and they have that chilled water. We use the same chillers that uh, they would use. And you essentially just put a shitload of salt in it and you keep it at 29 degrees because uh, that's where bacteria growth stops. And you have to watch that thing. Like that was the thing. Like the if the two ways that you could get fired, one is turning a live well, killing like messing something up and accidentally killing an entire live well because that's your entire fishery. The other one is like if you're on a wheel watch or an anchor watch and uh, the uh, the temperature starts to rise or it gets too cold and the fish actually start freezing. Um, that's not good. So it, it takes so long to get that all that thousand gallons of water plus fish inside to get to that 29 degree temperature. And also, so it's salt. Um, and the fish are, I guess, salt water too. So they actually don't freeze at 29 degrees. If you get it any colder, then they will start freezing. But uh, yeah, you gotta, that's like every hour we would have like a little sheet that we would have to write down what the temperature was at the top of the hour, every single hour, um, 24 hours a day. <laughs> I'm a science to that. Wow. Just from my understanding, I think for the listeners as well, because personally to me, maybe I'm a, maybe I'm a noob because I haven't fished San Diego and it's a different thing. What should we even be like in visualizing when it comes to these boats? Is it, is it like this? Are we talking here about those videos that, I, that we've seen go viral on Facebook of like 35 people on deck, like catching and swinging tuna overboard? Is that what? We oh, no, not like that. Not like that. Um, funny you mentioned those boats. I forgot what the actual term for those boats are, but the, the captain, one of the captains that, uh, that I worked with on that boat, he actually was on one of those mexican boats that did that and he said it was a pretty wild experience so you got to wear helmets and shit but yeah um no it's not quite like that if you uh if you guys back home want to want to see what that's kind of like uh my favorite long range videos uh just look up triple wall outdoors on youtube and he has like a whole video series going along um it'll kind of give you the the quick gist of it but it's you know it's fishing is it's 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 controlled chaos Cause you know how, I mean, it's, you have 25 people freelining a live bait at the same time. You know, it's, it's a lot of coordination. It's a shitload of teamwork and uh, just cooperation from everybody, especially when there's fish on. And um, like I said, those guys from a very young age, they, that's what they do is they live, they live bait tuna fish. Um, so they know how to follow their baits and they know how to, you know, keep their line straight and see if they need to go under this guy or go over to the next guy and, um, they're pretty good at keeping them straight, but uh, uh, it is like very high level controlled chaos. That's interesting, great. interesting. That's awesome. Crazy fishery. Maybe did you have any other questions? What um, uh, do you guys have any tournaments out of Venice? Yeah, so there's a there's a handful. Of them. You know, you got the the sporty tournaments, uh, the uh, Cajun Canyons. I think that's the big one out of Cypress Cove. There's two main marinas in in venice you have venice marina and cypress cove they're right next to each other we call cypress cove the uh, country club we call venice the junkyard and it's like a little fun friend rivalry that everyone has and it's like oh it's like get your ass back to the junkyard you it's a uh, you know we keep things light that way but there's that the biggest one down there um in terms of people is probably faux pas that's spelled f-a-u-x-p-a-u i think um that's a that's like a big you know i i would say it's local but it's from pretty much any any surrounding area it's like a just a fun just a fun four days you know everybody's there they have like probably a hundred different categories and then three or four subcategories for each species it's just you know you there's like a there's like a gaff top division all the way up to a blue marlin division and it's just it's a it's a good time that's a that's probably my favorite time to be in venice is during faux pas that's like the peak of of Venice Marina and Venice as a, as a city. So, and you know, not a ton of tournaments. There's a couple others too. I mean, there's like a, there's, there's shootout style tournaments that go on. Um, so they have the, I forgot what it's called, but um, this time of year, they have a shootout style tournament where you have, I think it's like 60 days, but you have to declare, I think it's two days, but the two days have to be back to back and it's two in Oahu. Um, those are the two main ones that pay out well. And they've recently um, this past year introduced, what's called the swordfish showdown which is i think it's like three days or two days three days 
I don't know. It's it's a shootout style tournament for for swords that you can fish for an entire month. And then you have the what's it called? The mojo might be a mojo tournament where it's like it's not just specific to Venice, but it's I think all the Gulf and uh, you can you don't have to declare days. You can fish as many days as you want. You know, way fish every single day. Isn't that Mongo? Mongo. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Mondo. Mondo. Yeah. That's what it is. Um, Yeah. That one's tough, especially if you have a guy in the charter fleet that uh, that. Uh, fishes it the the toughest division in that is definitely swordfish because blake rigsby that's the only thing he will fish for is swords swords triple tail and big tuna whenever they're on the lump um swords and triple tail that's a combination yeah i know right he's just mad at swords man he won't like he'll we get a lot of trips from blake because he uh he pretty much tells people like hey we're sword fishing it's like well we want to catch tuna it's like here go with bob and joe <laughs> it's like they'll take you they'll take a tuna fish you want a sword fish you can come with me <laughs> But no, he'll 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 uh tuna fish on the during lump season and shrimp boat season. But he is just I I haven't seen something like that. Someone getting so eaten up by by a species like that. Like it's really good in Venice. The sword fishery, it's good. But shit, man, like we've seen that guy go six days in a row without a bite and just sun up to sun down. Like you got to be fishing. you got to be mad at him to stare at a rod tip for six days straight oh, yeah. and not get a bite. Ouch. Yeah, but he, yeah, Don't he worry, is you, got the, you got the same people here in South Florida, man. They boys are crazy at them swords. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've met, I've met a couple of them. Uh, you guys get big ones though, man. I, the biggest fish that will pretty much, you'll pretty much ever see in my part of the Gulf is 300 pounds. Like I'm dying to see what a 500 pound sword looks like. Like to me that like wouldn't look real. Like that's such, I can't even imagine a 500 pound sword. <laughs> yeah. They get them here. Yeah. Oh yeah. All right. Cool. What uh, I know we talked quick about before we kind of got started, but it seems like most of the fleet there, a lot of Freemans are there. You see any more boats starting to make their way into the charter fleet, or is it just mainly Freemans? Uh, for up and coming boats, like new companies, newer companies, no, not really. I'm sure front runners are gonna try to get a boat in there somewhere. Um, but it's yeah i would imagine they're they're making enough holes now that, that someone's gonna buy one eventually uh but uh yeah mostly freemans and yellowfins that's like you know standard issue and you have to have yellowfins though i mean maybe just because it's close you know it's on the gulf of florida I, i've always considered yellowfins i mean they're great i've heard great they're great riding boats i've been on them they're awesome but the cockpit's tiny in my opinion yeah that's that is one issue with those boats uh i think some of the holes that they have, a, a lot of them are really big. So you got the 39 and the 42, I think. Those are the two sizes they have. I ran a 42 for a while. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How's the cockpit in that? In that? It's pretty big, right? I'm not I, It's not big enough. Just an average size. I mean, it's definitely not. It's not big by any means. I'd say it's more on the smaller side. But, I mean, for a 42-foot boat, you know. Right. You know, the 42 yellowfin is, like, it's all bow. <laughs> yeah, I got you. Huh. Yeah, but, you know, that whole fleet has to run if you really want to do it right i'm not saying it's 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 not possible to do it right in other um, types of boats but those yellowfins and freemans i mean i personally consider yellowfins probably the best v-hole um uh that has been in the boat market the past 20 years obviously there's so many new big giant v-holes getting made i i don't think i could confidently say that one company is the best right now um but you know, historically, Yellowfin has been very good. And then Freeman is a Freeman. It's the best center console ever made in terms of ride. And the rides are so long. Um, and, you know, luckily it never gets big in the Gulf, the waves. But you get a lot of chop. But, uh, you know, if you can manage that chop with those with those boats, you will may, be able to make um, a lot more days with those better riding boats. Um, How that's fast do you all, You boys in the Gulf are definitely crazy about them. Freemans. I mean, you know, we, the South Florida guys from Miami or the Keys of Palm Beach, and we fish in some really bad weather, especially this time of year. And there's like no Freemans at all in the sailfish fleet. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, we're all monohole guys. And I think we all will be for. Yeah. I, I mean, I there's no, for, I think, you know, maybe the long runs maybe is something to do with it, but I oh, think the maneuverability yeah. moving on the fish. Uh, oh, bro, these guys yeah. run far, bro. No, I know. Yeah, but. that's probably that's probably why. Um, you know, that's why we it took a while for us to get them in Jacksonville. Like we have sixty 
miles of fishable bottom in Jacksonville. And we're slowly starting to see more Freemans and Razor Cats, which is essentially a aluminum Freeman. Um, we're starting to see more and more, but you know, it's like you don't need to buy an eight hundred thousand dollar boat in South Florida. You're only going what you know a far run is like twenty miles. Like it, it, financially, it just like unless you would just want to be the big swing in D, there's not really a point to buy a Freeman down there unless you want to look good or if you make Bahamas runs, that's one thing. But I mean, you can easily get it done in a contender in a yellowfin just fine down there. Front runner. I, I think that's why you don't see him. Yeah, front runners too. Sorry, a little plug there. Sorry, front runner. <laughs> nah, you'll see it. You'll ride one soon. You'll like it. I have never, I've never personally ridden him, ridden him one, but you know, I have friends that uh tournament fishing them quite often. And you know, Phil Kelly loves his has won a lot of money king fishing in that boat. So I do trust him in that. And that is a good boat. I hope to ride one soon. We'll see. Maybe I'll buy one one day. There you go. I'll have to go see trial nice. yours. Yeah, I'll get you down, I'll catch you some sailfish. Be tight, man. Dude, who made your shirt? Who made my shirt? Yeah, we gotta get know. you some custom billfish ones. Yeah, I know. I do need them. This is our company shirt. This is what I need. I need like, I mean, this shirt's all right. I like hooded shirts, and we just the uh, show hooded shirts that we have are just ugly. I hate wearing them. Uh, we need to get some LA Blue Water uh, hooded shirts for the well, crew. Uh, uh, one of our team members will reach out to you, and we'll deck you guys out. We've got uh, we've got these new shirts, the teak ones. That's what I'm wearing right now, and. It, Dude, it's second to none. It's next yeah. level stuff. Yeah. We've seen That's like nice. a, there's been a big change in the industry from like the traditional performance shirts, I guess, kind of what you're wearing and what Nick's yeah, wearing. Yeah, like the OG to, Columbia hooded shirts. Yeah. Yeah. To, uh, and that world kind of is fading out. It's going more towards a softer, more like, just breathable. lighter, lighter, breathable material. That's kind of, that's what I'm wearing right now. And, mm -hmm. um, that's like, like the newest the thing the bamboo that we're style. The bamboo Correct. style. Correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I'm wearing right now. And, Dude, like game changer. Night and day. Recommend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. I'll, show, I'll get you some mock-ups so you can kind of see and check some stuff out. Yeah, for sure. Awesome, man. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, man. Yeah, for Nick, sure. It was awesome being on. Hopefully Nick, I didn't I ramble it? too much, but it was a good time hanging out with y'all. Yeah, man. Of course. Can I give a shout out, Nick? Go for it. All right. Then I, I want to give a shout out to Nicole, who works with us. She just won the Island Marada Fishing Club seen. Sailfish Tournament. Yeah. Seven sales released. So... Let's go, I, Nicole. I talk with her How about that, Nicole? Out, so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you gave her the secrets, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I also want to give a shout out to uh, Anthony, the A team, who's currently in Costa Rica fishing, <laughs> that gave me the opportunity to come back on this podcast. Yeah. He's probably not going to be too happy about his spot being taken. I know. It's temporary, though. I'm not doing as good of a job as he does, but <laughs> fun to be back. it's fun to be back on here. Well, thanks. And if you're in Venice, go check out our boy here. Cool. Joe Where Paul. can they find you? What's your, what's your social media handles? So uh, Joe VT Fishing on YouTube. That's my biggest platform. Same thing. Same name on Instagram. If you're interested in charters, all the information is on LABlueWater.com. Um, all the info and houseboat recommendations and stuff are all on there. Pretty streamlined, pretty easy. Check Make it sure out. To, uh, request a red snapper day with them exactly yeah, red snapper go. only yes <laughs> catch and release please there we go <laughs> cool man thanks all right thanks man yeah no problem guys thank you